Okay, this is an audio review of Chapter 3, Introduction to Sociology, Culture. So what is culture? Think about being a fish in a pond, right? Fish can see things like other fish, rocks, and food, but often they're not really seeing the water. In the same way, people walk around in air all the time, but we don't see the air. Culture's similar. It's all around us, but it's so ingrained into our day-to-day lives that we don't really see it unless we stop and look for it. So culture includes things like language, standards of beauty, hand gestures, styles of dress, kinds of food, music, all sorts of cool stuff. And there's both material and non-material culture. So material culture is the objects or belongings of a group of people. For example, money, tools, weapons, machines, art, any tactile thing that people make. So it's everything from what you would see in a museum to a grocery store, to an office building, to in your own homes, all the stuff. That's material culture. And non-material culture consists of ideas, attitudes, and beliefs of a society. So examples of non-material culture would be language and words, dress codes, etiquette, rituals, um, religion, values, and ethics. So what's considered ethical? It's definitely up to the culture to determine these standards. For instance, is solitary confinement ethical? It's practiced all over the US, but it's really considered unethical, especially from a you know international standpoint. Um, and there's an interesting history there. We got rid of solitary confinement in the early 1900s because it was considered cruel, ineffective, and expensive. But thanks to the tough on crime policies of the 80s and 1990s, particularly the war on drugs, the practice was reintroduced and normalized. So there are people in this country who have been in solitary for years. On any day, over 60,000 people are experiencing this phenomenon, which is considered torture by psychological experts. So what's considered right and wrong in a culture is specific to its values, its norms, and its history. And with this example, we see it changes over time as society changes. So culture's learned. It's passed from one generation to the next through communication, not through genetics. So it's important to understand that culture is passed from one generation to the other through communicative interaction. Culture's not inherited. So for example, like a baby that was born to a Chinese mother and a Chinese father, but then when it's a week old, it's adopted by an American family and moves to the U.S., the child may have been born Chinese, but they grow up speaking English, eating pizza, you know, playing video games, riding their bike, doing all that American children stuff. So if these things were biological and, or, and not um, reflective of how you're socialized within a culture, then the baby would, you know, have the culture, customs, language of its parents, of its biological parents, right? Speak Chinese or, but that doesn't actually work that way, right? We know that culture is learned. The baby learns culture from its adopted parents and that becomes its normal um, environment, right? In which it develops. So ethnocentrism and cultural relativism are two different approaches to understanding culture. And one is wrong and one is right, basically. <laughs> so, let's say. so, you know, a lot of cultures have many things in common, but we tend to look for differences and focus on the differences between cultures. So there's different ways to approach cultural differences, and ethnocentrism is the first one. This just means judging another culture based on how it compares to the social norms that we're used to. So, for example, I remember once trying this um, protein bar thing where it was made of like cricket flour. So they like, you know, raise crickets, ground them up into a flour. And uh, it tasted just as crappy as any other protein bar. <laughs> you couldn't, it's not like there's like little cricket legs sticking out. It's not like you even would notice the cricket. But it had like way more protein. And this is important in a time period where climate change is really spurned on by factory farming and our meat consumption, especially in this country and in the Western world. So you know, having those alternatives like cricket flour, it didn't really, even though it was on Shark Tank and it got some popularity, it didn't really take because of the culture, right? So what we eat is socially constructed. And when we judge a difference as being bad, 
it's just because it isn't the way we do something. That's ethnocentrism, right? So there's plenty of cultures that eat insects and it's not weird, right? So it's really a matter of what do you grow up eating and what do you not, right? Is a cow sacred or is a cow food? Um, or, you know, is a dog a house pet or is it a meal, right? These things are, it's, it's easy for us to look at the way that we live and judge all other societies based on that. So a lot of the history of ethnocentrism up to its prevalence today is linked to cultural imperialism, which is the deliberate imposition of one's culture over another. European colonial views shaped the rules, laws, and cultural practices that were allowed and those that were deemed wrong and deviant. So sometimes ethnocentrism can also be the result of culture shock, which is an experience of personal disorientation when confronted with an unfamiliar way of life. So you may have experienced this yourself. If you've ever watched a program on television showing a remote tribe of people and their way of life seems very different, you might say something like, oh, that's gross. I can't believe they eat that. So you're assuming that your way of life is better than their way of life. Interestingly, if that tribe watched your daily life, they'd question a lot of things we consider normal, right? So if you think about some of the, way, some of the things of your daily routine, take a moment. Think about this. You know, what are the kind of things that happen in our daily routines? right? You have, you know, people shave their faces, they get dressed, they go to, they drive to work, right? They go through a drive through they buy a $6 coffee, right? Things that seem very mundane to Americans, right? But if you're trying to explain them to a Martian visiting Earth, you know, or even if you try to pretend yourself to be that Martian, to see an outside view from that kind of insider status that we have, it might make you think more about how strange our customs are to someone outside of our perspective. So the real key is all cultures are super weird, right? That's what makes them so fun to study. So cultural relativism is the other way to look at cultures, um, cultural differences. So cultural relativism is the process of understanding other cultures on their own terms. So rather than judging them according to our own culture, we just try to understand them and say, oh, people do this because of this value system they have or because of this religious practice or because of this historical impact, right? So when studying any group, as a sociologist, you know, it's very important to employ cultural relativism. It helps sociologists see others more objectively. So... You can think about the importance of cultural relativism when thinking about studying distant or remote cultures, or even when studying different cultures within the U.S., right? So people that live in New York communicate differently than people that live in Texas, right? If you're a researcher from New York, you'd have to consider those differences when conducting research in Texas, right? So a lot of times we, it's easy for us to kind of malign other cultures because they're different instead of just saying, well, they're just different. There's not one that's right or wrong. What's right or wrong is really a matter of perspective. Okay, so different elements of culture. First, you have values and beliefs. So values are a culture's standard for discerning what is good and just in society. Values are deeply embedded and critical for transmitting and teaching a culture's beliefs. So the difference between the value, those are kind of what's right and wrong, and the beliefs are the convictions that we hold to be true. So an example of a belief is the American dream, right? I wish I could show this George Carlin video to you. You're welcome to YouTube it if you can handle all the F-bombs. But um, he does this great bit about the American dream where he says, they call it the American dream because you have to be asleep to believe it. So, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a great rant. Highly recommend it. But again, as not a tenured professor, can't throw a bunch of F-bombs right in the middle of this lecture. So, unfortunately. So, <laughs> when looking at the difference between values and beliefs, again, values often suggest how people should behave, but they don't accurately reflect how people actually behave. So, values portray an ideal culture or what we'd like to live up to. But there's also the real culture, how people really behave in practice, and they don't always overlap perfectly. We set a standard, but not everyone lives up to it. So we want people to behave. So we create social rewards and punishments to reward people if they follow the rules and punish people if they break the rules. So people sanction certain behavior by giving it their support, approval, or permission, or by putting in place actions of disapproval or unsupported sanctions. So this is, sanctions can be 
a confusing term because it basically can be positive or negative. So for example, you got an A on your test, you know, I'm going to get you a ice cream, right? A, a lactose free ice cream, <laughs> right? Um, that would be a positive sanction. If I was like, hey, you failed your test and I'm taking your phone. That's a negative sanction, right? So sanctions, whether positive, like rewarding someone or negative, like punishing someone are just forms of social control. They're ways to encourage conformity to social norms. So people follow the norms, so they'll be rewarded, right? So you follow the norms at school, you're rewarded with good grades. And when people break social rules, they're punished. And values, they, they would change over time, right? Values vary from culture to culture. So this is how we can tell they're socially constructed. If something changes over time, and if it's different from culture to culture, then we know it's coming from the society itself. It's socially constructed. Okay, so norms. Norms, just think of the word normal, right? What do we consider normal? And that's our norms. So norms define how to behave in accordance with what society has deemed as good. For instance, in the U.S., we value our privacy. Therefore, it would be considered a breach of a norm to spy on another person, like our smartphones do like our computers and TVs do, like the government does. Anyway, side note, sorry. There's different kinds of norms. So if you're in an elevator, you know there are a few acceptable behaviors. You're following norms if you look at the door, buttons, or stare at the floor. But however, if you turn and stare at the person standing beside you, you're likely to make them feel uncomfortable. You can tell you've violated a norm because that person will step aside or press the door open button and probably get the hell out of there so I don't have to stand there with you staring at them. If you violate a more important norm, you might make someone gasp or physically react to your action. And you'd be able to tell that the norm you violated was a more important one. This happens really commonly by accident with people who are traveling abroad or even to different regions in the U.S. if they're not familiar with the norms of that specific culture or area. So, you know, I'm sure you can have experiences of your own of you know, having those moments where you violate a norm or you unintentionally violate a norm and people react and try to basically teach you what's appropriate for that space and how you're supposed to act. So formal norms are established written rules. Laws are formal norms. But so are college entrance exam requirements, right? So there's lots of different kinds of formal norms, but there's also informal norms. Informal norms are behaviors that are generally and widely conformed to, usually because we're socialized that way. So some norms come from, you know, that are, that are taught to us indirectly. So for instance, what we call, you know, um, the hidden curriculum. Like you go to school and you learn subjects, but what else do you learn? You learn this hidden curriculum, these informal norms, like to where you're supposed to sit in the classroom, what you're supposed to do, meaning you show up at a certain time, you sit on your ass and you have an authority figure kind of delegate to you. Why? That's kind of trying to prepare you for adult life where you have to show up to a job, have a boss, and you're supposed to defer to them, right? So that's kind of the way in which informal norms often work. There's also mores and folkways. So mores, this is a norm that carries moral significance, hence more. So it's closely related to the core values of a group and often involves severe repercussions if you violate a moray. So mores can include things that society values as significantly important norms. So again, think of the term morals, right? Lying, cheating, murder, <laughs> things like that. Um, that obviously if we value life, then taking someone's life is something that's a moray, right? Folkways are loosely enforced norms that involve common customs, practices, or procedures that ensure smooth interaction and acceptance. So folkways could be something like, if you've ever been to like a rich person restaurant or like some fancy ass dinner, and they'll have like five forks, and you're like, oh crap, which one's the shrimp fork? Which one's the dinner fork? <laughs> which one's the salad fork? Like, they might not come up and be like, you're poor, you don't belong here because you didn't use the right fork, right? But there are certain loosely enforced norms, like how what things are expected. So for instance, um, when you're coming to class, like I would expect you to have already read the chapter so that what I'm talking about just kind of reiterates what the chapter says and builds upon it because learning is repetition. But I'm not necessarily going to like 
assault you or kick you out of the class or <laughs> things like that. I'm not going to put you in jail because you didn't. Uh, the consequence really just becomes your grade, right? But anyway, let's move on. Okay, different um, concepts as well from culture chapter would be symbols and language. So symbols are gestures or objects that have meaning associated with them and are recognized by people who share a culture. If you live in the U.S. and someone holds up their middle finger to you, you know they're making a gesture that expresses disapproval, <laughs> frustration, right? You're flipping someone the bird. It's intended to be insulting. But in another culture, that same signal or symbol could just mean something completely different, right? For example, it could just mean like, hey, you pick, you, you flip the bird, that means, I don't know, hey, that person over there stole your parking spot, right? Like it could be anything. And so this is actually really interesting. There's whole books about this of like uh, the specific gestures that we use and how you're supposed to, you know, if you're traveling internationally, there's certain like hand gestures, like a thumbs up, which to us means good, but does not mean that in other cultures. Right? So it's interesting that these things we take for granted, like a thumbs up or peace sign or things like that can really mean different things in different contexts. So gestures are the signs we make with our body, right? Hand gestures, but it can also be facial expressions, right? You like roll your eyes when someone says something to you, right? That communicates something even if it's not vocal, right? Because language is a system of vocal sounds, but also of gestures. And we talk about how a lot of language is you know, nonverbal, the way you kind of tilt your head or shrug your shoulders or, you know, the kind of the context of how you say something like your tone. Like if you're like, fine, or like, fine, right? <laughs> There's a different context to that. So it's kind of interesting. That's what we call paralinguistics, right? That language can, inver can involve the words we use, but how we use them, our tone, our inflections, and the visual components, right? Like what gesture we're making, right? You're like, I'd be happy to do that while you're flipping someone off. Um, then that obviously <laughs> goes against what your words are saying because the gesture's telling them not so much. So this is probably the most significant component of culture is language. It helps us communicate, whether it's, you know, rolling our eyes, whether it's saying things, whether it's writing down words, because language is really, really important because it gives us a shared sense of understanding, right? It shapes not only how we communicate, but it also shapes our perceptions of how we see things. So the Sapir-Whorf hypo hypothesis basically is the idea that our language structures our thought and our ways of looking at the world are embedded in our language. So if I made up a word right now and told you the word I made up is an animal and then asked you to picture that animal, you probably couldn't do it, right? But if I was like, picture a cow, you could probably think of a cow. Right? The superior wharf hypothesis tells us that if we don't have language or the words to describe something, we can't even think of it. In other words, language is shaping our thoughts. Right? Sometimes people use the example like the Inu would have 20 words for snow or something like that. Right? Where here in Southern California, you don't need 20 words for snow because we don't get enough snow ever for that to ever be an issue. Right? But here, you might have 20 different words to describe different aspects of traffic on the freeway, right? So oftentimes language is very local. And you notice this when you travel to other places, not just accents, but the kinds of words and phrases that people take on because that's just like what, think of being socialized, it's like the soup you're sitting in as you're cooking, as you're developing. And the language around us, what we see people doing, these things shape how we can even understand or see the world. Okay, different kinds of culture is another aspect of chapter three. So you have high culture, and we're not talking about like Snoop Dogg and high times. Basically, you're talking about the pattern of cultural experiences and attitudes that exist in like the wealthiest, the highest class segments of a society. So people associate high culture with prestige, with power, with intellectualism. So this could be fancy stuff like, I don't know, smoking like really gross cigars or going to an opera, attending the ballet. Oh, I will meet you at the symphony, right? All, all of those things are lovely, but they're all associated with upper class values or aesthetics. And they often are somewhat exclusionary to lower classes because that's kind of the whole point of high culture. It's exclusion. It's only the fancy people can do it. Like the mega yachts, like Jeff Bezos having a yacht so big that they had to actually like tear down 
a historic bridge because his yacht wouldn't fit through it, right? <laughs> I mean, to have a yacht that's so big that, like, it's bigger than commercial boats, that's, that's wild. So anyway, that's the kind of thing, you know, like chandeliers or classical music, like the things that are associated with wealthier people. Then you have pop culture. This just refers to the patterns of cultural ex experiences and attitudes that exist in mainstream society. So unlike high culture, pop culture is open and accessible to everyone. So a big part of pop culture would be watching sports, right? That's a big one. Popular TV shows or things that a lot of people like. So my example here, I put like the MCU, the Marvel Comics universe, right? You want to talk about some culture? We can talk about that pop culture, right? It's almost become a shared language with people. Like I've totally noticed this in my own life. I'm, I'm a nerd for a lot of different fandoms. So I feel like sometimes when you can't connect with people over certain topics, like maybe we disagree over politics or things like that, it's easier to be like, you know, talk about these things through a shared sense of something like the Marvel Comics universe, or I don't know, people are really into this with like the Harry Potter universe or, you know, any of these kind of fandoms in popular culture can sometimes, you know, like Star Wars, Star Trek, any of these things where they give their own values and meanings and that we can often use them as a shared sense of understanding or even just like liking the same soccer team, having the same fandom because we both support the same basketball team. Things like that can actually bring us together as well. Or I guess the drama that can ensue when you have a house full of Lakers fans and then you have that one uncle that's into the Celtics at, at Thanksgiving. Okay, also parts of culture are subcultures and countercultures. So a subculture, it's just like, it's basically exactly what the word says. <laughs> subculture, a smaller group within a culture. So a subculture is a group within society that's differentiated by distinctive values, norms, and lifestyles. Subcultures tend to exist harmoniously within a larger society, and they interact with the dominant group, but they maintain their distinctive values, norms, and lifestyles. So I'm sure you right now are a member of a subculture. All of us are. So some subcultures, I could give you examples that at some point I was a member of, were um, skateboarders, vegans, college students, right? Those would all be examples of subcultures. So think about it. Um, being a skateboarder, right? Does that challenge the entire society? Not necessarily, but you develop your own perspectives and viewpoints, right? Like, or as a college student, you have a different viewpoint on the world than people that haven't gone to college, right? The way that you interpret the time that you need for classes, kind of conflicts that can arise with your friends that didn't go to college because they're just like partying and you want to go do some of those things but you're also like I have to study for a test that somehow your distinctive values norms and lifestyle are different then there's counterculture and the real difference there is that counterculture is a group within society that rejects and actively opposes society's values and norms so some people would say well don't vegans reject and actively oppose society's values and norms. I would say not necessarily. I'd say they're more of a subculture than a counterculture because they're just trying to get all of us to not destroy the planet and murder our own bodies by consuming things that we don't need to. But um, a counterculture is more like, you know, um, cults, like religious extremists that are like, they want to overthrow society or like, you know, these like neo-Nazi white supremacist people that they want to create a white ethno state, right? Like they basically want to resubject to horrible treatment all communities of color and really a lot of white people that they don't consider white in the same way as them. And, um, you know, they want to create a state where like white supremacy is ensconced into the law and into society, which I would argue it still is in our, <laughs> they're already living in that culture. But anyway, we'll get more into that when we talk about, um, you know, some of the social institutions later on. But something like, a, you know, neo-Nazi white supremacist people, they want to destroy the society that believes in democracy, equality, freedom, liberty, and they want to replace it with something that says that white people should be dominant, Right. So countercultures tend to exist separately from the dominant culture in many ways, and they openly reject society's values. So it's difficult for them to interact within those cultures, right? 
Okay, some more interesting stuff. We got cultural change. So, cultures usually change slowly and incrementally, but change can also happen in rapid and dramatic ways. At times, a subculture can influence the mainstream and become part of the dominant culture. Or something that's dominant can change to a counterculture. Again, I, I think of skateboarding. Like, when I was a little kid, skateboarding was more fringe, and then it became, like, commercially successful throughout the 90s, and you had all of these pro skaters come out, and now it's, like, way more mainstream. It's not, like, you have, like, little kids' Instagram accounts where they're, like, six years old and on a skateboard. It's not considered, like, deviant. So in that way, sometimes the the subcultures themselves become part of the dominant culture. And one of the key ways that material culture can change is through technology. Advances like the internet have helped to disseminate information and create social movements. So culture is constantly changing, and the norms within society change as well. For instance, at one point, tattoos were considered appropriate only for, like, servicemen or people in freak shows, <laughs> right? But now many college students and many others in society have tattoos. The subculture influenced the norms of the dominant culture, and the dominant culture changed. So an innovation refers to an object or concept's initial appearance in society. So something new happens, like uh, the cell phones or the internet or something like that. Those innovations that then oftentimes are technologically driven really change the way that we interact, the way that we do things or understand our lives. So discoveries change the culture and often change our ways of thinking or doing things. Whether it's discovering, you know, the laws of gravity, scientific laws, or how to do things better, or figuring out previously unknown things, discoveries are really impactful to our culture. Also, you know, it's interesting that not everyone is happy about discoveries. When Copernicus said that the Earth revolved around the sun and not the other way around, Religious people were pissed because it challenged their perspective that the Earth was the center of the universe. So when Simmelweis told other doctors they should maybe wash their hands in between touching sick people or cutting up corpses and then delivering babies, they thought he was dumb and excluded him socially. Right? They were like, germs that we can't see? What the hell is that? That's stupid. Right? And of course, he was correct, of course. And thankfully, doctors now wash their hands in between patients. But it's interesting that for that time period, a lot of the illnesses that were spreading within hospitals were because the doctors were, you know, spreading them themselves. Right? So sometimes when you discover something, it challenges the way people already live or the way that they assume the world is. And people take offense to it or have a really hard time hearing it. But that's still, you got to push through. You got to make sure people wash their damn hands, right? As an example. Um, inventions result when something new is formed from an existing object or concept, but put together in a new way. If you think of all the 20th century inventions that were state-of-the-art and amazing, but we take for granted today, like a vacuum cleaner. Could you imagine not having a vacuum cleaner? A dryer. Like my grandmother, well, not my one that passed away. I still have one with me, thank God, that's 99 years old. But um, my other grandmother, she never had a dryer because she was like, why would I need a dryer? I have a clothesline. <laughs> she didn't want to pay the energy costs. She didn't want to do that stuff. She's like, I'll just hang it up on the line, right? Or she had basically a rack that was like lines. And um, yeah, the sun does it for you. The wind does it for you. It's pretty interesting. But things like, again, we take those things for granted. Washers, dryers, cars, right? Dishwashers, <laughs> a stove. I mean, for Christ's sake. Life without cars would be wild. But we could probably breathe a lot better though, right? <laughs> so all of those things like cars, dryers, vacuum, whatever it is, all those, all those material culture things that we created, those inventions in the 20th century, affected the culture, like, think about cell phones. I remember when they first happened because I'm ancient. My dad had one of these car phones where it, like, looked like a big-ass, almost like a suitcase of, the, of a thing. And it had a literal, like, you picked up a receiver and put it to your ear. <laughs> it's pretty great. Um, it could be in a museum now, right? And before that, there was this magical time period, which you're not aware of, but there was this time where, like, if you called someone and they weren't home, you just had to call back later. Or you had this, if they were super fancy and rich, they had this thing called an answering machine. 
where <laughs> you would leave a message for someone and then they'd call you back. So such a different world now. I feel like there is a detriment to younger generations that never lived in that society because you don't know how to disconnect. You've never had a time where people can't reach you or bother you. There's something kind of magical about, I know for myself personally, if I forget my cell phone, I'm like, I feel like I'm, I'm alone. I feel like I'm missing something, right? But for years or for generations, people existed without these things. It's just when we adapt to them and they become part of our normal daily life, it then seems like something's missing, right? So honestly, I really suggest it. Turn that bad boy off and go look at a tree. It's really going to help you out. Anyway, so nowadays technology develops so quickly that within a couple of years, computers and other systems become out of date. Material culture spreads. So like smartphones, they spread, but it takes time before people accept them as a part of the non-material culture. So for phones that happened like a decade ago, when they first started being more for gaming and watching stuff and being on social media, more than being actual phones, even the meaning of what the device is for changes. It's for apps. When it rings, I'm always like, why is my phone ringing? Why is someone calling me? right? Like, why is that happening? And you're like, oh, right, because it's a phone. That's what it's for, right? But often, our even our interpretation of it is different now because we use it for different things. Cultural lag refers to the time that happens between the introduction of a new item of material culture and its acceptance as part of the non-material culture. Cultural lag can cause problems. So right now, there's a lot of talk of infrastructure, right? Obviously, the Biden administration and Congress passed that infrastructure bill to address the fact that for decades, cuts and then more cuts have happened to projects to protect and update infrastructure from roads and bridges that are old as hell and sketchy to the fact that many areas are still cut off from high-speed internet access needed for education and work across the U.S. The problem is, by the time some of these changes tend to update, new updates are needed. It's like how, you know, here in Southern California, by the time they add one lane to the freeway, they need to add three, right? So there is often this lag. Okay, theoretical perspectives on culture. As promised, we're going to talk about these different theories throughout the class. So functionalists view society as a system of interrelated parts. Like I was saying in chapter one, it's like puzzle pieces that all fit together to, to make a whole. Cultural norms function to support the fluid operation of society, and cultural values guide people into making choices. Culture then exists to meet the members of society's basic needs. So functionalists also study culture in terms of those values. Conflict theory looks at these things differently, right? So conflict theory views social structure as inherently unequal based on power differentials related to social identities or issues like class, gender, race, and age. So for a conflict theorist, culture is seen as reinforcing issues of privilege for certain groups based upon race, sex, gender, class, disability, immigration status, and so on and so on and so on. We could keep going, right? So they say that inequalities exist within a culture's value system. So the social norms benefit some people and hurt others. The core of conflict theory is the effect of economic production and materialism. So they argue that people who have less power, right, meaning less money in our system, also have less ability to adapt to cultural changes. This is kind of part of the narrative around climate change, right? Is that, I mean, to me, it's the most telling thing in life. What are the billionaires doing right now? Are they fixing the planet? No, they're trying to go to Mars. <laughs> I mean, seriously, think about that. If you have less power, how are you going to afford to go to Mars? You're not, right? Actually, them going to Mars, it's not going to work out anyway. We'll talk about that later in this class, but that, that ain't going to work out. The only way that they can do that is if there's like a group of people here on Earth that actually facilitate that from Earth. Um, and like, hell no. The billionaires get on their spaceship and they're on their own. <laughs> Anyway, okay, we'll get back to that later. So basically, again, with conflict theory, they're just saying if you have less power, you can't adapt as well to cultural change because you have less ability to adapt. Symbolic interactionism is a sociological pers perspective that's most concerned with how meaning is made in face-to-face -face interactions. Interactionists look at the ways in which culture is created and maintained by how we interact with each other and how individuals interpret each other's actions.
So culture happens as we make it happen. The ways we talk, the language we use, the clothes we wear, our hairstyles. This is why when you look back at old pictures, you see how different styles have been in the past and it makes you realize just how much those things change and just how quickly they change. So it's always in flux and changes as we change.